A Descent into Egypt by Algernon Blackwood Chapter 1 He was an accomplished, versatile man whom some called brilliant. Behind his talents lay a wealth of material that right selection could have lifted into genuine distinction. He did too many things, however, to excel in one, for a restless curiosity kept him ever on the move. George Eiley was an able man. His short career in diplomacy proved it, yet when he abandoned this for travel and exploration, no one thought it a pity. He would do big things in any line. He was merely finding himself. Among the rolling stones of humanity, a few acquire moss of considerable value. They are not necessarily shiftless. They travel light. The comfortable pockets in the game of life that attract the majority are too small to retain them. They are in and out again in a moment. The world says, what a pity, they stick at nothing. But the fact is that like questing wild birds, they seek the nest they need. It's a question of values. They judge swiftly, change their line of flight and are gone. Not even hearing the comment that they might have retired with a pension. And to this homeless questing type, George Eiley certainly belonged. He was by no means shiftless. He merely sought with insatiable yearning that soft, particular nest where he could settle down in permanently. And to an accompaniment of sighs and regrets from his friends, he found it. He found it, however, not in the present, but by retiring from the world without a pension unclothed with honours and distinctions. He withdrew from the present and slipped softly back into a mighty past where he belonged. Why, how, obeying what strange instincts, this remains unknown, deep secret of an inner life that found no resting place in modern things. Such instincts are not disclosable in twentieth-century language, nor are the details of such a journey properly describable at all, except by the few, poets, prophets, psychiatrists and the like, such experiences are dismissed with the neat museum label, queer. So, equally, must the recorder of this experience share the honour of that little label, he who by chance witnessed certain external and visible signs of this inner and spiritual journey. There remains, nevertheless, the amazing reality of the experience, and to the recorder alone was some clue of interpretation possible, perhaps because in himself also lay the lure, though less imperative, of a similar journey. At any rate, the interpretation may be offered to the handful who realise that trains and motors are not the only means of travel left to our progressive race. In his younger days I knew George Eiley intimately. I know him now. But the George Eiley I knew of old, the arresting personality with whom I travelled, climbed, explored, is no longer with us. He is not here. He disappeared, gradually, into the past. There is no George Eiley, and that such an individuality could vanish while still his outer semblance walks the familiar streets, normal, apparently, and not yet fifty in the number of his years, seems a tale, though difficult, well worth the telling. For I witnessed the slow submergence. It was very gradual. I cannot pretend to understand the entire significance of it. There was something questionable and sinister in the business that offered hints of astonishing possibilities. Were there a corps of spiritual police, the matter might be partially cleared up. But since none of the churches have yet organised anything effective of this sort, one can only fall back upon variants of the blessed Mesopotamia and whisper of derangement and the like. Such labels, of course, explain as little as most other clichés in life. That well-groomed, soldierly figure strolling down Piccadilly, watching the races, dining out, there's no derangement there. The face is not melancholy, the eyes not wild. The gestures are quiet and the speech controlled. Yet the eye is empty, the face expressionless. 
vacancy reigns there provocative and significant. If not unduly noticeable, it is because the majority in life neither expect nor offer more. At closer quarters you may think questioning things, or you may think nothing, probably the latter. You may wonder why something continually expected does not make its appearance, and you may watch for the evidence of personality, the general presentment of the man has led you to expect. Disappointed, therefore, you may certainly be, but I defy you to discover the smallest hint of mental disorder and of derangement or nervous affliction. Absolutely nothing. Before long, perhaps, you may feel you are talking with a dummy, some well-trained automaton, a non-entity devoid of spontaneous life. And afterwards you may find that memory fades rapidly away, as, as though no impression of any kind has really been made at all. All this, yes, but nothing pathological. A few may be stimulated by this startling discrepancy between promise and performance, but most, accustomed to accept face values, would say, pleasant fellow, but nothing in him much, and an hour later, forget him altogether. For the truth is, as you perhaps divined, you have been sitting beside no one. You have been talking to, looking at, listening to, no one. The intercourse has conveyed nothing that can waken human response in you, good, bad, or indifferent. There is no George Eiley, and the discovery, if you make it, will not even cause you to creep with the uncanniness of the experience, because the exterior is so wholly pleasing. George Eiley today is a picture with no meaning in it that charms merely by the harmonious colouring of an inoffensive subject. He moves undiscovered in the little world of society to which he was born, secure in the groove first habit has made comfortably automatic for him. No one guesses, none, that is, but the few who knew him intimately in early life. And his wandering existence has scattered these. They have forgotten what he was. So perfect indeed is he in the manners of the commonplace fashionable man that no woman in his set is aware that he differs from the type she is accustomed to. He turns a compliment with the accepted language of her textbook, motors, golfs and gambles in the regulation manner of his particular world. He is an admirable, perfect automaton. He is nothing. He is a human shell. Chapter 2 the name of George Eiley had been before the public for some years when, after a considerable interval, we met again in a hotel in Egypt. I for my health, he for I knew not what, at first. But I soon discovered, archaeology and excavation had taken hold of him, though he had gone so quietly about it that no one seemed to have heard. I was not sure that he was glad to see me, he had first withdrawn, annoyed, it seemed, at being discovered, but later, as though after consideration, had made tentative advances. He welcomed me with a curious gesture of the entire body that seemed to shake himself free from something that had made him forget my identity. There was pathos somewhere in his attitude, almost as though he asked for sympathy. I've been out here, on and off, for the last three years, he told me, after describing something of what he'd been doing. I find it the most repaying hobby in the world. It leads to a reconstruction, an imaginative reconstruction, of course, I mean, of an enormous thing the world had entirely lost. A very gorgeous, stimulating hobby, believe me, and a very enti... He quickly changed the word exacting one, indeed. I remember looking him up and down with astonishment. There was a change in him, a lack, a note was missing in his enthusiasm, a colour in the voice, a quality in his manner. The ingredients were not mixed quite as of old. I didn't bother him with questions, but I noted thus at the very first a subtle alteration. Another facet of the man presented itself. Something that had been independent and aggressive was replaced by a certain emptiness that invited sympathy. Even in his physical appearance the change was manifested. 
this odd suggestion of lessening. I looked again more closely. Lessening was the word. He had somehow dwindled. It was startling, vaguely unpleasant too. The entire subject, as usual, was at his fingertips. He knew all the important men and had spent money freely on his hobby. I laughed, reminding him of his remark that Egypt had no attractions for him, owing to the organised advertisement of its somewhat theatrical charms. Admitting his error with a gesture, he brushed the objection easily aside. His manner, and a certain glow that rose about his atmosphere as he answered, increased my first astonishment. His voice was significant and suggestive. "'Come out with me,' he said in a low tone, "'and see how little the tourists matter, "'how inappreciable the excavation is "'compared to what remains to be done, "'how gigantic,' he emphasised the word impressively, "'the scope for discovery remains.' He made a movement with his head and shoulders that conveyed a sense of the prodigious, for he was of massive build. His cast of features stern and his eyes set deep into the face shone past me with a sombre gleam in them I didn't quite account for. It was the voice, however, that brought the mystery in. It vibrated somewhere below the actual sound of it. Egypt, he continued, and so gravely, that at first I made the mistake of thinking he chose the curious words on purpose to produce a theatrical effect that has enriched her blood with the pageant of so many civilizations, that has devoured Persians, Greeks and Romans, Saracens and Mamelukes, a dozen conquests and invasions besides. What can mere tourists or explorers matter to her? The excavators scratch their skin and dig up mummies and... As for tourists, he laughed contemptuously, flies that settle for a moment on her covered face to vanish at the first signs of heat. Egypt is not even aware of them. The real Egypt lies underground, in darkness. Tourists must have light to be seen as well as to see, and the diggers... He paused, smiling, with something between pity and contempt I did not quite appreciate, for, personally, I felt a great respect for the tireless excavators, and then he added with a touch of feeling in his tone as though he had a grievance against them, and had not also dug himself. Men who uncover the dead, restore the temples and reconstruct a skeleton, thinking they have read its beating heart. He shrugged his great shoulders, and the rest of the sentence may have been but the protest of a man in defence of his own hobby, but that there seemed an undue earnestness and gravity about it that made me wonder more than ever. He went on to speak of the strangeness of the land as a mere ribbon of vegetation along the ancient river, to rest all ruins, desert, sun-drenched wilderness of death, yet so breakingly alive with wonder power and a certain disquieting sense of deathlessness. There seemed for him a revelation of unusual spiritual kind in this land, where the past survived so potently. He spoke almost as though it obliterated the present. Indeed, the hint of something solemn behind his words made it difficult for me to keep up the conversation and the pause that presently came I filled in with some word of questioning surprise, which yet, I think, was chiefly in concurrence. I was aware of some big relief in him, some enveloping emotion that escaped my grasp. Yet, though I did not understand, his great mood swept me. His voice lowered then, as he went on to mention temples, tombs and deities, details of his own discoveries and of their effect upon him, but to this I listened with half an ear, because in the unusual language he had first made use of, I detected this other thing that stirred my curiosity more, stirred it uncomfortably. Then the spell, I asked, remembering the effect of Egypt upon myself two years before, has worked upon you as upon most others, only with greater power. He looked hard at me signs of trouble showing themselves faintly in his rugged, interesting face. I think he wanted to say more than he could bring himself to confess. He hesitated. I'm only glad, he replied after a pause, 
it didn't get hold of me earlier in life. It, it would have absorbed me. I should have lost all other interests. And now, that curious look of helplessness, of asking sympathy, flitted like a shadow through his eyes. Now that I'm on the decline, it, it matters less. On the decline... I cannot imagine by what blundering I missed this chance he never offered again. Somehow or other the singular phrase passed unnoticed at the moment and only came upon me with its full significance later, when it was too awkward to refer to it. He tested my readiness to help, to sympathise, to share his inner life. I missed the clue. For at the moment a more practical consideration interested me in his language. Being of those who regretted that he had not excelled by devoting his powers to a single object, I shrugged my shoulders. He caught my meaning instantly. Oh, he was glad to talk. He felt the possibility of my sympathy underneath, I think. No, oh, you, you take me wrongly there, he said with gravity. What I mean, and I ought to know if anyone does, is that while most countries give, others take away. Egypt changes you. No one can live here and remain exactly what he was before. This puzzled me. It startled, too, again. His manner was so earnest. And Egypt, you mean, is one of the countries that take away? I asked. The strange idea unsettled my thoughts a little. First, takes away from you, he replied. But in the end, takes you away. Some lands enrich you? He went on, seeing that I listened, while others impoverish. From India, Greece, Italy, all ancient lands, you return with memories you can use. From Egypt, you return with nothing. Its splendour stupefies. It's useless. There is a change in your inmost being, an emptiness, an unaccountable yearning. But you find nothing that can fill the lack you're conscious of. Nothing comes to replace what has gone. Uh, you have been drained. I stared, but I nodded a general acquiescence. Of a sensitive artistic temperament this was certainly true, though by no means a superficial and generally accepted verdict. The majority imagine that Egypt has filled them to the brim. I took his deeper reading of the facts. I was aware of an odd fascination in his idea. Modern Egypt, he continued, is after all but a trick of civilization and there was a kind of breathlessness in his measured tone. But ancient Egypt lies waiting, hiding, underneath, though dead. She is amazingly alive, and you feel her touching you. She takes from you, she enriches herself. You return from Egypt less than you were before. What came over my mind is hard to say. Some touch of visionary imagination burned its flaming path across my mind. I thought of some old Grecian hero speaking of his delicious battle with the gods, battle in which he knew he must be worsted, but yet in which he delighted because at death his spirit would join their glorious company beyond this world. I was aware, that is to say, of resignation as well as resistance in him. He already felt the effortless peace which follows upon long, unequal battling, as of a man who has fought the rapids with the strain beyond his strength, then sinks back and goes with the awful mass of water smoothly and indifferently over the quiet fall. Yet it was not so much his words which clothed picturesquely an undeniable truth as the force of conviction that drove behind them shrouding my mind with mystery and darkness. His eyes, so steadily holding mine, were lit, I admit, yet they were calm and sane as though of a doctor discussing the symptoms of that daily battle to which we all finally succumb. This analogy occurred to me. There is, I stammered a little, faltering in my speech, an incalculable element in the country somewhere, I confess. Uh, you put it rather strongly, though, don't you? He answered quietly, moving his eyes from my face towards the window that framed the serene and exquisite sky towards the Nile. The real, invisible Egypt, he murmured, I do find rather strong. I find it difficult to deal with. You see, 
and he turned towards me, smiling like a tired child. I think the truth is that Egypt deals with me. It, it draws, I began, then started as he interrupted me at once, into the past. He uttered the little word in a way beyond me to describe. There came a flood of glory with it, a sense of peace and beauty, of battles over and of rest attained. No saint could have brimmed heaven with as much passionately enticing meaning. He went willingly, prolonging the struggle merely to enjoy the greater relief and joy of the consummation. For again he spoke as though a struggle were in progress in his being. I got the impression that he somewhere wanted help. I understood the pathetic quality I had vaguely discerned already. His character naturally was so strong and independent. He now seemed weaker, as though certain fibres had been drawn out. And I understood then that the spell of Egypt, so lightly chattered about in its sensational aspect, so rarely known in its naked power, the nameless creeping influence that begins deep below the surface and thence sends delicate tendrils outwards, was in his blood. I, in my untaught ignorance, had felt it too, it is undeniable. One is aware of unaccountable, queer things in Egypt. Even the utterly prosaic feel them. Dead Egypt is marvellously alive. I glanced past him, out of the big windows, where the desert glimmered in its featureless expanse of yellow leagues, two monstrous pyramids signalling from across the Nile. And for a moment, inexplicably it seemed to me afterwards, I lost sight of my companion's stalwart figure that was yet so close before my eyes. He had risen from his chair, he was standing near me, yet my sight missed him altogether. Something, dim as a shadow, faint as a breath of air, rose up and bore my thoughts away, obliterating vision too. I forgot for a moment who I was. Identity slipped from me. Thought, sight, feeling, all sank away into the emptiness of those sun-baked sands, sank, as it were, into nothingness, caught away from the present, enticed, absorbed. And when I looked back again to answer him, or rather to ask what his curious words could mean, he was no longer there. More than surprised, if there was something of shock in the disappearance, I turned to search. I hadn't seen him go. He had stolen from my side so softly, slipped away silently, mysteriously, and so easily. I remember that a faint shiver ran down my back as I realised that I was alone. Was it that momentarily I had caught a reflux of his state of mind? Had my sympathy induced in myself an echo of what he experienced in full? A going backwards? A loss of present vigour, the enticing subtle draw of those immeasurable sands that hide the living dead from the interruptions of the careless living. I sat down to reflect and, incidentally, to watch the magnificence of the sunset, and the thing he had said returned upon me with insistent power, ringing like distant bells within my mind. His talk of the tombs and temples passed, but this remained. It stimulated oddly. His talk, I remembered, had always excited curiosity in this way. Some countries give while others take away. What did he mean precisely? What had Egypt taken away from him? And I realised more definitely that something in him was missing, something he possessed in former years that was now no longer there. He had grown shadowy already in my thoughts. The mind searched keenly but in vain, and after some time I left my chair and moved over to another window, aware that a vague discomfort stirred within me that involved uneasiness for him. I felt pity, but behind the pity was an eager, absorbing curiosity as well. He seemed receding curiously into misty distance, and the strong desire leaped in me to overtake to travel with him into some vanished splendour that he had rediscovered. The feeling was a most remarkable one, for it included yearning, the yearning for some nameless, forgotten loveliness the world has lost. It was in me, too. 
At the approach of twilight, the mind loves to harbour shadows. The room, empty of guests, was dark behind me. Darkness, too, was creeping across the desert like a veil, deepening the serenity of its grim, unfeatured face. It turned pale with distance. The whole great sheet of it went rustling into night. The first stars peeped and twinkled, hanging loosely in the air, as though they could be plucked like golden berries. And the sun was already below the Libyan horizon, where gold and crimson faded through violet into blue. I stood watching this mysterious Egyptian dusk, while an eerie glamour seemed to bring the incredible within uneasy reach of the half-faltering senses. And suddenly the truth dropped into me. Over George Eiley, over his mind and energies, over his thoughts and over his emotions too, a kind of darkness was also slowly creeping. Something in him had dimmed, yet not with age. It had gone out. Some inner night stealing over the present obliterated it, and yet he looked towards the dawn, like the Egyptian monuments his eyes turned eastwards. And so it came to me that what he had lost was personal ambition. He was glad, he said, that these Egyptian studies had not caught him earlier in life. The language he made use of was peculiar. Now I am on the decline. It matters less. A slight foundation, no doubt, to build conviction on, and yet I felt sure that I was partly right. He was fascinated, but fascinated against his will. The present in him battled against the past. Still fighting, he had yet lost hope. The desire not to change was now no longer in him. I turned away from the window so as not to see that grey encroaching desert, for the discovery produced a certain agitation in me. Egypt seemed suddenly a living entity of enormous power. She stirred about me. She was stirring now. This flat and motionless land, pretending it had no movement, was actually busy with a million gestures that came creeping round the heart. She was reducing him. Already from the complex texture of his personality, she had drawn one vital thread that in its relation to the general wolf was of central that in its relation to the general wolf was of central importance. Ambition. The mind chose the simile, but in my heart, where thought fluttered in singular distress, another suggested itself as truer. Thread changed to artery. I turned quickly and went up to my room where I could be alone. The idea was somewhere ghastly. Chapter 3 Yet, while dressing for dinner, the idea exfoliated as only a living thing exfoliates. I saw in George Eiley this great question mark that had not been there formerly. All have, of course, some question mark and carry it about, though with most it rarely becomes visible until the end. With him it was plainly visible in his atmosphere at the heyday of his life. He wore it like a fine curved scimitar above his head. So full of life, he yet seemed willingly dead. For though imagination sought every possible explanation, I got no further than the somewhat negative result that a certain energy, wholly unconnected with mere physical health, had been withdrawn. It was more than ambition, I think, for it included intention, desire, self-confidence as well. It was life itself. He was no longer in the present. He was no longer here. Some countries give, while others take away. I find Egypt difficult to deal with. I find it, and then that simple, uncomplex adjective, strong. In memory and experience, the entire globe was mapped for him. It remained for Egypt then to teach him this marvellous new thing. But not Egypt of today. It was vanished Egypt that had robbed him of his strength. He had described it as underground, hidden, waiting. I was again aware of a faint shuddering, as though something crept secretly from my inmost heart to share the experience with him, and as though my sympathy involved a willing consent that this should be so. With sympathy there must always be a shedding of the personal self. Each time I felt this sympathy it seemed that something left me. 
I thought in circles, arriving at no definite point where I could rest and say, that's it, I understand. The giving attitude of a country was easily comprehensible, but this idea of robbery, of uh, deprivation, baffled me. An obscure alarm took hold of me, for myself as well as for him. At dinner, where he invited me to his table, the impression passed off a good deal, however, and I convicted myself of a woman's exaggeration. Yet, as we talked of many a day's adventure together in other lands, it struck me that we oddly left the present out. We ignored today. His thoughts, as it were, went most easily backwards, and each adventure led, as by its own natural weight and impetus, towards one thing, the enormous glory of a vanished age. Ancient Egypt was home in this mysterious game life played with death. The specific gravity of his being, to say nothing for the moment of my own, had shifted lower, farther off, backwards and below, or, as he put it, underground. The sinking sensation I experienced was of a literal kind. And so I found myself wondering what had led him to this particular hotel. I had come out with an affected organ the specialist promised me would heal in the marvellous air of Helwan, but it was queer that my companion also should have chosen it. Its clientele was mostly invalid, German and Russian invalid at that. The management set its face against the lighter, gayer side of life that hotels in Egypt usually encourage eagerly. It was a true rest house, a place of repose and leisure, a place where one could remain undiscovered and unknown. No English patronised it. One might easily, the idea came unbidden suddenly, hide in it. Then you're doing nothing just now, I asked, in the way of digging. No big expeditions or excavating at the moment? I'm recuperating, he answered rather carelessly. I've had two years up at the Valley of the Kings and uh, overdid it rather. But I'm by way of working at a little thing near here, across the Nile and he pointed in the direction of Saqqara, where the huge Memphian cemetery stretches underground from the Dashur pyramids to the Giza monsters four miles lower down. There's a matter of a hundred years in that alone. You must have accumulated a mass of interesting material. I suppose later you'll make use of it, a, a book or... His expression stopped me. That strange look in the eyes that had stirred my first uneasiness. It was as if something struggled up a moment, looked bleakly out upon the present, then sank away again. More, he answered listlessly, than I can ever use. It's much more likely to use me. He said it hurriedly, looking over his shoulder as though someone might be listening. Then smiled significantly, bringing his eyes back upon my own again. I told him that he was far too modest. If all the excavators thought like that, I added, we ignorant ones should suffer. I laughed, but the laughter was only on my lips. He shook his head indifferently. They do their best. They do wonders, he replied, making an indescribable gesture, as though he withdrew willingly from the topic altogether, yet could not quite achieve it. I know their books. I know the writers, too, of various nationalities. He paused a moment, and his eyes turned grave. I cannot understand quite how they do it, he added, half below his breath. The labour, you mean, uh, the strain of the climate and so forth. I said this purposely, for I knew quite well he meant another thing. The way he looked into my face, however, disturbed me so that I believe I visibly started. Something very deep in me sat up, alertly listening, almost on guard. I mean, he replied, that they must have uncommon powers of resistance. There. He had used the very word that had been hiding in me. It puzzles me, he went on, for, with one exception, they are not unusual men. In the way of gifts, oh yes. It's in the way of resistance and protection that I mean. Self-protection, he added with emphasis. It was the way he said resistance and self-protection that sent a touch of cold through me. I learned later that he himself had made surprising discoveries in these two years penetrating closer to the secret life of ancient sacerdotal Egypt than any of his predecessors or co-laborers, then, inexplicably, he'd ceased. But this was told to me afterwards and by others. At the moment I was only conscious of this odd embarrassment. 
I didn't understand, yet felt that he touched upon something intimately personal to himself. He paused, expecting me to speak. Egypt, uh, perhaps, merely pours through them, I ventured. They give out mechanically, hardly realising how much they give. They report facts, devoid of interpretation. Whereas with you, it's the actual spirit of the past that is discovered and laid bare. You live it. You feel old Egypt and disclose her. That divining faculty was always yours. Uncannily, I used to think. The flash of his sombre eyes betrayed that my aim was singularly good. It seemed a third had silently joined our little table in the corner. Something intruded, evoked by the power of what our conversation skirted, but ever left unmentioned. It was huge and shadowy. It was also watchful. Egypt came gliding, floating up beside us. I saw her reflected in his face and gaze. The desert slipped in through walls and ceiling, rising from beneath our feet, settling about us, listening, peering, waiting. The strange obsession was sudden and complete. The gigantic scale of her swam in among the very pillars, arches and windows of that modern dining room. I felt against my skin the touch of chilly air that sunlight never reaches, stealing from beneath the granite monoliths. Behind it came the stifling breath of the heated tombs, of the serapium, of the chambers and corridors in the pyramids. There was a rustling as of myriad footsteps far away, and as of sand the busy winds go shifting through the ages. And in startling contrast to this impression of prodigious size, Eily himself wore suddenly an air of strangely dwindling. For a second he sank visibly before my very eyes. He was receding. His outline seemed to retreat and lessen, as though he stood to the waist in what appeared like flowing mist, only his head and shoulders still above the ground. Far, far away I saw him. It was a vivid inner picture that was somehow transferred objectively. It was a dramatised sensation, of course. His former phrase, now that I am declining, flashed back upon me with sharp discomfort. Again, perhaps, his state of mind was reflected into me by some emotional telepathy. I waited, conscious of an almost sensible oppression that would not lift. It seemed an age before he spoke, and when he did... There was the tremor of feeling in his voice he sought nevertheless to repress. I kept my eyes on the table for some reason, but I listened intently. It's you that have the divining faculty, not I, he said, an odd note of distance even in his tone, yet a resonance as though it rose up between reverberating walls. There is, I believe, something here that resents too close inquiry or rather that resists discovery, almost takes offence. I looked up quickly, then looked down again. It was such a startling thing to hear on the lips of a modern Englishman. He spoke lightly, but the expression of his face belied the careless tone. There was no mockery in those earnest eyes, and in the hushed voice was a little creeping sound that gave me once again the touch of goose flesh. The only word I can find is subterranean. All that was mental in him had sunk, so that he seemed speaking underground, head and shoulders alone visible. The effect was almost ghastly. Such extraordinary obstacles are put in one's way, he went on, when the prying gets too close to the reality. Physical, external obstacles, I mean. Either that or, or the mind loses its assimilative faculties. One or other happens. His voice died down into a whisper. And discovery ceases, of its own accord. The same minute then he suddenly raised himself like a man emerging from a tomb. He leaned across the table. He made an effort of some violent internal kind, on the verge, I fully believe, of a pregnant personal statement. There was confession in his attitude. I think he was about to speak of his work at Thebes and the reason for its abrupt cessation. For I had the feeling of one about to hear a weighty secret, the responsibility unwelcome. This uncomfortable emotion rose in me as I raised my eyes to his somewhat unwillingly, 
only to find that I was wholly at fault. It was not me he was looking at. He was staring past me in the direction of the wide, unshuttered windows. The expression of yearning was visible in his eyes again. Something had stopped his utterance. And instinctively I turned and saw what it was. So far as external details were concerned, at least I saw it. Across the glare and glitter of the uncompromising modern dining room, past crowded tables and over the heads of Germans feeding unpicturesquely, I saw the moon. Her reddish disk hanging unreal and enormous lifted the spread sheet of desert till it floated off the surface of the world. The great window faced the east where the Arabian desert breaks into a ruin of gorges, cliffs and flat-topped ridges. It looked unfriendly, ominous, with danger in it. Unlike the serena sand dunes of the Libyan desert, there lay both menace and seduction behind its flood of shadows. And the moonlight emphasised this aspect, its ghostly desolation, its cruelty, its bleak hostility, turning it murderous. For no river sweetens this Arabian desert. Instead of sandy softness, it has fangs of limestone rock, sharp and aggressive. Across it, just visible in the moonlight as a thread of paler grey, the old camel trail to Suez beckoned faintly. And it was at this that he was looking so intently. It was, I know, a theatrical, stage-like glimpse, yet in it a seductiveness most potent. Come out, it seemed to whisper, and taste my awful beauty. Come out and lose yourself and die. Come out and follow my moonlit trail into the past, where there is peace and immobility and silence. My kingdom is unchanging underground. Come down. Come softly. Come through sandy corridors below this tinsel of your modern world. Come back. Come down into my golden past. A poignant desire stole through my heart on moonlit feet. I was personally conscious of a keen yearning to slip away in unresisting obedience. For it was uncommonly impressive, this sudden haunting glimpse of the world outside. The hairy foreigners uncouthly garbed, all busily eating in full electric light, provided a sensational contrast of emphatically distressing kind. A touch of what is called unearthly hovered about that distance through the window. There was weirdness in it. Egypt looked in upon us. Egypt watched and listened, beckoning through the moonlit windows of the heart to come and find her. Mind and imagination might flounder as they pleased, but something of this kind happened undeniably, whether expression in language fails to hold the truth or not. And George Eiley, aware of being seen, looked straight into the awful visage, fascinated. Over the bronze of his skin there stole a shade of grey. My own feeling of enticement grew, the desire to go out into the moonlight to leave my kind and wander blindly through the desert, to see the gorges in their shining silver and taste the keenness of the cool, sharp air. Further than this with me it did not go, but that my companion felt the bigger, deeper draw behind this surface glamour, I have no reasonable doubt. For a moment, indeed, I thought he meant to leave the table. He had half risen in his chair. It seemed he struggled and resisted, and then his big frame subsided again. He sat back. He looked in the attitude his body took, less impressive, smaller, actually shrunken into the proportions of some minuter scale. It was as though something in that second had been drawn out of him, decreasing even his physical appearance. The voice, when he spoke presently with a touch of resignation, held a lifeless quality as though deprived of virile timbre. It's always there, he whispered, half collapsing back into his chair. It's always watching, waiting, listening, almost like a monster of the fables, isn't it? 
It makes no movement of its own, you see. It's far too strong for that. It just hangs there, half in the air and half upon the earth, a gigantic web. Its prey flies into it. That's Egypt all over. Do you feel like that too, or does it seem to you just imaginative rubbish? Uh, to me, it seems that she just waits her time. She gets you quicker that way. In the end, you're bound to go. There's power, certainly, I said, after a moment's pause to collect my wits, my distress increased by the morbidness of his simile. For some minds there may be a kind of terror, too, for weak temperaments that are all imagination. My thoughts were scattered, and I could not readily find good words. There's a startling grandeur in a sight like that, for instance, and I pointed to the window. You feel drawn, as if you simply had to go. My mind still buzzed with his curious words. In the end, you're bound to go. It betrayed his heart and soul. I suppose a fly does feel drawn, I added, or a moth to the destroying flame, or is it just an unconsciousness on their part? He jerked his big head significantly. Well, well, he answered, but the fly isn't necessarily weak or the moth misguided. Over-adventurous, perhaps, yet both obedient to the laws of their respective beings. They get warnings, too. Only when the moth wants to know too much, the fire stops it. Both flame and spider enrich themselves by understanding the natures of their prey, and fly and moth return again and again until this is accomplished. Yet George Eiley was as sane as the head waiter who, noticing our interest in the window, came up just then and inquired whether we felt a draught and would prefer it closed. Eiley, I realised, was struggling to express a passionate state of soul, for which, owing to its rarity, no adequate expression lies at hand. There is a language of the mind, but there is none as yet of the spirit. I felt ill at ease. All this was so foreign to the unwholesome, strenuous personality of the man as I remembered it. But, my dear fellow, I stammered, aren't you giving poor old Egypt a bad name she hardly deserves? I feel only the amazing strength and beauty of it. Or, if you like, but none of this resentment you so mysteriously hint at. You understand, for all that, he answered quietly, and again he seemed on the verge of some significant confession that might ease his soul. My uncomfortable emotion grew. Certainly he was at high pressure somewhere. And if necessary, you could help. Your sympathy, I mean, is a help already. He said it half to himself and in a suddenly lowered tone again. A help, I gasped. Uh, my sympathy, uh, of course, if... A witness, he murmured, not looking at me. Someone who understands yet does not think me mad. There was such appeal in his voice that I felt ready and eager to do anything to help him. Our eyes met, and my own tried to express this willingness in me. But what I said I hardly know, for a cloud of confusion was on my mind, and my speech went fumbling like a schoolboy's. I was more than disconcerted. Through this bewilderment, then, I just caught the tail end of another sentence in which the words, Relief it is to have someone to hold to, when the disappearance comes, it sounded like voices heard in a dream, but I missed the complete phrase and shrank from asking him to repeat it. Some sympathetic power struggled to my lips, though what it was I know not. The thing I murmured, however, seemed apparently well chosen. He leaned across and laid his big hand a moment on my own with eloquent pressure. It was as cold as ice. A look of gratitude passed over his sunburned features. He sighed and we left the table then and passed into the inner smoking-room for coffee, a room whose windows gave upon column terraces that allowed no view of the encircling desert. He led the conversation into channels less personal and, thank heaven, less intensely emotional and mysterious. What we talked about I now forget. It was interesting, but in another key altogether— his old charm and power worked. The respect I had always felt for his character and gifts returned in force, but it was the pity I now experienced that remained chiefly in my mind. For this change in him became more and more noticeable. 
He was less impressive, less convincing, less suggestive. His talk, though so knowledgeable, lacked that spiritual quality that drives home. He was uncannily less real. And I went up to bed uneasy and disturbed. It is not age, I said to myself, and assuredly it is not death he fears, although he spoke of disappearance. It is mental in the deepest sense. It is what religious people would call soul. Something is happening to his soul.